Chapter 20 Click! Click! Ideas were colliding like balls on a pool table, moving so fast that I couldn't keep up with them. Pieces of puzzle were coming together and clicking their clicks and delivering pictures. Pictures of car keys and letters from lawyers and tickets and pens. It didn't make sense, or it didn't completely. I needed more pieces to work the thing out, but the first one was easy, or ought to be easy. I lived in a bookstore. I needed a book. I was standing on tiptoe and looking at shelves when the back office telephone rang in the dark. I let it get answered by Hunnaker's voice and then waited tensely with ears cocked. Spike, in a whisper, a hurried rasp that meant Donna was coming or possibly there, said, Sam, check your email. I sent you some stuff. I went back to the office and started the Mac. The only new message that waited was Spike's. I did what you wanted. I checked on hench and endangered species. Here are some links. I looked at the list and then clicked on the first one. WantedCatKillers.com The internet's something, isn't it? Name any weirdo subject, it's right at your feet. And there was my villain. Herman Hench, known as Peter Patter or Jack Spratt, was wanted for killing Siberian tigers. Endangered tigers so totally rare, there were maybe 112 in the world. And the sentence, per tiger, was seven years. Hench was suspected of murdering, too. I learned that the sentences sprung from a law, a worldwide agreement America had signed in the 1970s, making a crime out of capturing, killing, collecting, importing, possessing, or smuggling. A long list of folks, from the elderly tortoise on Gutless's floor to the elegant elephant killed for its tusks that were hung on his mantle. I clicked on the link to Endangered Strangers. The listing of creatures went on for a foot. Odd-looking strangers I'd never heard of. Komodo dragons and Javan snails. And then came the birds. I looked up at their pictures and matched all the parrots I'd seen in the cages at Gutless's mansion with birds on the list. My eyes grew wider. Tibetan antelopes, used to make blankets, or sweaters and shawls, or the soft, gutless afghan I'd seen on his couch, were also endangered, and said to be worth about 600000 in dollars and cents, and enough time in prison to make you think twice about pulling the wool off somebody's back. I thought for a second, and scrolled to the top, and confirmed that possessing was part of the crime. I typed in gutless, and waited seconds and got to his bio, and started to laugh. I was hitting pay dirt at length and at last. There was one other piece that was part of the puzzle. I knew where to find it. It's where I'd begun in the depths of the bookstore. I raced to the shelves. The book I was after was right in the O's. Moonshot, the prize-winning novel by John D. O'Shaughnessy. At twenty of seven on Monday morning, I worked at the telephone, making the calls. I was calling a meeting for 8 p.m. First I called Buster in room 20 and gave him instructions on how to proceed. Then I called Slasher at Healthier Pet. Then I called Spike with some further instructions, and waited till seven to waken Jean-Claude. I stared at the ceiling. That was my list. Spike would get Bridget at 7.30. Bustard said Wilmer would be there on time. I was racked from not sleeping. I had read through the night and then shot off an email and paced on the sill. I looked up at the sun rising gamely but weakly, and felt my exhaustion. I started to yawn. Then I went to Caboodle, where Sue waited sweetly. 
and curled up beside her and slept like a dog.